Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're uh, cutting through the noise on a frontier market that presents, well, the ultimate investment paradox, Oof. Uganda. Mm -hmm. When you look at the geological makeup of Uganda, I mean, you see massive strategic mineral, well, we're talking gold, copper, cobalt, and critically REs, or rare earth elements. Right. Like those targeted in the huge Makutu project. These are, you know, the building blocks for the modern green economy. The potential is immense. It really is. But every global investor looking at that geologic potential seems to slam into a brick wall of policy risk. It's uh, quite the contrast. That dual nature is exactly what our sources cover today. We're pulling threads from uh, three distinct areas. The new regulatory environment, specifically the Mining and Minerals Act of 2022. Okay. The coal hard investment perception data from the Fraser Institute, always revealing. Always. And finally, something quite different. A radical cutting edge technical proposal. It involves using proprietary AI, known as KeyGen, to try and tackle Uganda's technical data problems head on. So, our mission today is clear. We want to figure out why this country is the quintessential high risk, high potential jurisdiction. We're delivering the critical shortcut you need to understand how advanced tech is trying to de risk exploration, right. and how the government is well, simultaneously using legislation to dramatically redefine the financial and social terms for getting involved. And just to add a bit more context on the potential upside here, the anticipated start of oil production, that's expected to significantly boost Uganda's overall economic growth. We're talking projections like 10.4% uh, in fiscal year 2027. Wow, 10.4%. Yeah. And that kind of macroeconomic momentum is certainly designed, or at least hoped, to create positive spillover effects for the mining sector, too. Okay, let's uh, let's unpack this then. Starting with the geology, Uganda has a pedigree, right? It's not just theoretical potential. Yeah, not at all. We have historical sites like the Columbia Copper Mines, which operated way back in the 50s and, importantly, contain significant cobalt resources. Which is very relevant today. Exactly. We have the Busia Gold District, Muko Iron Ore. And we keep coming back to the strategic importance of that Makutu Rare Earths project. It's targeting those high-value, heavy REEs. The rock is clearly there. The rock is definitely there. Yeah. But the global perception, its let's just say it's problematic. When the Fraser Institute surveys mining executives worldwide, Uganda ranks 72nd out of 86 jurisdictions on the overall investment attractiveness index. Ouch. 72nd. And it gets worse if you look deeper. It ranks 79th on the Policy Perception Index. That what? signals, well, it signals serious concerns about policy stability and the rules of the game. 79th on policy. That is an extreme gap between what's in the ground and what executives think about the operating environment. It's a huge disparity. So what specific challenges are driving that fear, that really low policy perception score? Well, you have to look at both the technical side and the... Uh, the governance or non-technical side. Technically, Uganda suffers from a pretty serious lack of modern, high-resolution geological data. Right. A lot of the historical data is low-res, and there are major gaps in coverage. Plus, actually accessing and integrating the existing government data, which might not even be great quality, can be, frankly, a bureaucratic nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then there are the logistical challenges. They are immense. So you're saying investors are dealing with really remote, inaccessible terrain, poor roads, and if they want modern sample analysis, they have to basically put them on a plane, deal with customs, ship them halfway around the world because there aren't enough local analytical labs. Pretty much, yeah. That sounds like a major capital expense and a huge delay before you even think about drilling. Precisely. It adds significant time and cost. Yeah. And that logistical headache is then compounded by the non-technical issues, the things driving that low policy score. First, the slow pace of licensing. How slow are we talking? You could be looking at six to 12 months, maybe longer, just to get an initial exploration license. That's potentially a year of overheads, salaries, right. before you've even broken ground. A year of just waiting. And then I assume you run into land conflicts. Absolutely. That's a huge one. We're talking complex land tenure issues, managing widespread conflicts with ASSM. That's artisanal and small-scale mining. Right. The small-scale miners. Exactly. And dealing with increasingly high community expectations. These non-geological factors can completely derail a multi-million dollar project, no matter how good the deposit looks on paper. Okay, this brings us neatly to the government's formal response, doesn't it? The Mining and Minerals Act of 2022. 
It's meant to modernize things, yes, but its main impact seems to be redefining that whole financial relationship. It really does. And this is where it gets uh, really critical for anyone trying to run a financial model on a Ugandan project. You're spot on. The 2022 Act fundamentally changed the structural cost of accessing Uganda's minerals. Yeah. The big one. For any large or medium-scale mining license, there is now a single, non-negotiable structural element that investors just have to accept, the State Participation Clause. Okay, detail that for us. What does it entail? It's a mandatory provision. The state, which will be managed by the new Uganda National Mining Company, or UNMMC, gets to claim a non-dilutable ownership interest of up to 15%. Mm -hmm. And here's the kicker. At absolutely no cost. No cost. So a free carried interest or FCI. Exactly. A 15% free carried interest. Wait a minute. Isn't that 15% FCI fundamentally different, maybe even worse than just having a high tax rate? How so? Well, a tax rate, you know, can sometimes be mitigated or optimized through capital allowances, depreciation, maybe structured debt. This 15%, it sounds like a permanent non-negotiable slice taken right off the top of the equity, calculated before you even think about taxes or operating expenses. That is the core distinction, yes. Yeah. It's non-dilutable. The state gets this 15 percent stake without ever having put a shilling into the millions, maybe tens of millions, in sunk exploration costs that actually define the resource in the first place. It's a direct foundational reduction in the net present value, NBV, of any project right from day one. It automatically pushes the economic hurdle higher, potentially making deposits that might have been marginal completely unviable. Okay, so that's the big upfront structural cost. Beyond that 15%, what about ongoing payments, royalties, things like that? Yeah, you still have the standard fiscal requirements, of course. Mm -hmm. Ad valorem royalties are set at rates like 5% um, for strategic minerals. Think gold, cobalt, lithium, and 4% for base metals like copper and nickel. Pretty standard rates, mostly. Mostly, yes. But the Act also focused really intensely on formalizing the social contract, trying mm -hmm. to address those community issues we talked about. Right, which ties directly back to those potential conflicts with local communities and ASSM. How does the royalty sharing work now under the Act? Is that formalized? It is. It's legally mandated now. Schedule 2 of the Act spells it out. 70% of the royalty goes to the central government. Hmm. Okay, but then 15% goes to the local governments in the area, 10% goes down to the sub-county or town council level, and crucially, 5% is distributed directly to the landowners or lawful occupants of the land where the mining happens. Hmm. 5% direct to landowners. That's interesting. Designed to manage expectations and maybe reduce conflict locally? That seems to be the intention, yes. To give local stakeholders a direct, legally defined benefit stream. And it sounds like securing the social license to operate the SLO isn't just good practice anymore. It's actually a legal requirement. Precisely. That's a major shift. The Act mandates that companies must negotiate and conclude a formal Community Development Agreement, CDA, with the affected communities before operations can even start. So no CDA, no mining license activation. Essentially, yes. Failure to secure this means you don't get to mine, period. And on top of that, there are pretty stringent national content requirements baked into the law now as well. Which brings us back to something you touched on earlier, the human capital issue. If companies are legally required to prioritize hiring Ugandans, submit training and succession plans for expat roles, and prefer local goods and services, that puts a huge burden on the investor, doesn't it? Especially if there are skill gaps. It absolutely does. And the data shows why that mandate probably exists. Despite the positive economic growth projections, Uganda's Human Capital Index, HCI, which measures the productivity of the next generation of workers, is low. It stands at just 0 0.39. 0.39 out of 1. Out of a potential 1, yes. Huh. You see this deficit clearly in education metrics. While Ugandan children expect about 6.8 years of schooling on average, the actual learning achieved is only equivalent to 4.3 years. They call these learning-adjusted years of schooling, L-A-Y-S. So a big gap between years in school and actual learning outcomes. A significant gap, yeah, indicating issues with quality. The new act essentially makes the private mining sector legally responsible for helping to fill that skills gap through mandatory training and local hiring preferences. Okay, so let's pause here. On one side, we have these uh, quite complex policy risks and mandatory costs. That 15% FCI is the big one, fundamentally right. limiting the potential financial returns. Right. On the other side, we still have that huge technical problem, the poor, low-resolution historical data. How does technology step in to solve that piece of the puzzle, that technical uncertainty. This is where the proposed proprietary AI technology comes in. 
KGIN, it stands for Constrained Area Gridding for Enhanced Interpretation. It's being developed through a partnership, companies from India, Canada, the U.S. involved, I believe. Okay. And its entire purpose is integrated prospectivity mapping. The idea is to bypass or at least significantly mitigate the technical limitations imposed by Uganda's patchy historical data. So what makes Cajun different? Why isn't it just, you know, running some standard processing algorithms on old magnetic survey data? What's the AI part doing? Well, its core functionality is apparently quite advanced. First, it uses machine learning techniques to enhance really subtle geophysical anomalies, things that traditional manual interpretations might easily miss or dismiss as noise. Okay, finding weaker signals. Exactly. But second, and this is the innovation I find most compelling, it imposes known geological criteria directly onto the geophysical data during the interpretation process. Right. You mentioned that phrase earlier, imposing geological criteria. I love that. It sounds like the machine is forcing the raw physics data to make sense geologically. Like it can't just put a target anywhere. That's a good way to put it. It means the AI ensures that its interpretations, let's say delineating potential fault structures or identifying gravity highs that might indicate dense bodies, are strictly confined within geologically plausible domains. So it wouldn't flag a target in a rock type where that kind of mineralization is known not to occur. Precisely. It prevents the model from generating targets in areas that are geologically impossible based on the known mapping, lithology, or structural setting. It's trying to mimic the experienced critical judgment of a seasoned exploration geologist. But doing it much faster and over huge areas. At continental scale and speed, yeah. That's potentially game-changing. What kind of data streams does KGEN actually ingest to achieve that level of uh, constrained interpretation? It's designed to integrate pretty much everything available. All the geophysical data it can get, modern historical aeromagnetic, radiometric, gravity, airborne electromagnetics. It uses remote sensing outputs, things like spectral classification for alteration mapping, identifying structural lineaments from satellite imagery. Okay. And crucially, it feeds in all the historical reports it can find. Documented mineral occurrences, old drill core assays, geological maps. It uses these known points as critical ground truth to essentially train the algorithm and boost its predictive power. So the outcome then, if this works as advertised, is a major de-risking of the exploration budget itself. Absolutely. That's the promise. Instead of sinking millions into broad regional surveys hoping to get lucky, mm -hmm. investors could potentially get these highly predictive prospectivity maps. Pointing them where to look more closely. Exactly. This should accelerate discoveries, allow much more optimized exploration budgets, and act as a powerful tool to attract smart money investors who want to see the technical risk substantially reduced before yeah. they commit capital to specific targeted opportunities. It aims to neutralize that technical risk factor that has plagued exploration in Uganda for decades. And just quickly, on the institutional side, it's worth noting that this kind of high-tech development isn't happening in a vacuum, right? There's broader support. That's your point. The institutional backing is significant. If you look at the World Bank Group's portfolio in Uganda, it's substantial around $3.9 billion in credits and grants currently active. Okay. What's particularly noteworthy for our discussion is that the energy and extractive sector is the single largest component of that portfolio. It dominates, accounting for 15%. 15% just for energy and extractives. Yes. That reflects ongoing high-level institutional commitment, not just to improving governance, but also to supporting the technical and financial environment needed for the sector to actually develop and thrive. They see the potential too. Okay, so let's try and synthesize what we've uh, deep dived into today. Uganda clearly holds enormous, globally critical mineral wealth. That seems undisputed. Mm -hmm. And advanced technology like this Cajun AI is rapidly emerging to address the technical hurdle, the problem of poor data and efficient targeting. It holds that promise, yes. However, the operating landscape remains fundamentally defined by these significant policy hurdles largely embedded in that 2022 act. That dual nature persists, doesn't it? The new law is absolutely firm. If you want access to this geological prize, you must accept the government's terms, both financial and social. Specifically, that mandatory 15% non-dilutable state equity, the free carry. And the legally binding community development agreements. Those are the big ones. So the AI prospectivity map, if it delivers, promises to transform Uganda from just a country with vague potential into a country with concrete targeted opportunities. We've seen how technology might solve the geological unknowns. Right. But for the sophisticated investor, the kind needed for large-scale development, this raises a final, perhaps provocative question. 
Which factor truly represents the biggest hurdle to long-term success in Uganda today? Is it the underexplored geology, which these new AI tools are rapidly mapping and de-risking? Or is it the known, politically mandated 15% state participation that fundamentally reduces project returns right from day one, regardless of the geology? What stands out to you?